Yeah, a lot of the things I, I did in, uh, in games were probably things that I tried in the backyard uh, many, many times. I remember a try I scored against New South Wales in a, in a Queensland primary schools team. It was a six-stone team. We were playing out at uh, Endeavour Field, uh, Cronulla Sutherland's home ground, and we took a kick for touch. We had a penalty about 10 metres out from the line. We kicked the ball out, and the ball probably uh, went across the sideline about a foot short of the line, and uh, the hooker went up to take the tap. And it just ran straight through my mind. I, I remember I used to do things in the backyard and playing there against my brothers, and I ran up and I grabbed the ball off the hooker, and I said, I'm taking that tap. That's mine. And he looked at me and just gave me the ball, and uh, I went up and turned my back to the New South Wales players, only one foot out from the try line, and I put the ball down and uh, I said, come on to the ball, fellas, run onto it. And, of course, all the New South Wales guys braced themselves, ready to tackle this guy that was running onto the ball. And I simply just bent down, tapped the ball and put it backwards between my legs onto the try line. And the referee ran from the try line back to, to where he expected the play to be uh, after the, the, the front row running onto the ball. Uh, received it and uh, he sort of looked around and said what's going on and the, the touch judge looked down and I said it's a, it's a try I put the ball down on the try line and the New South Wales guys looked around and one of them said he, he can't do that and the touch judge came in he said yes he, he put the ball on the try line and I'd probably done that in the backyard 10 or 15 times in the games that I played against my brother so it's, it's just funny some some of the time how things that seem so indifferent or not at all important that you do in the backyard finally come to light. When I was a kid, it was very humiliating to go along to Lang Park and watch the Maroons get thrashed year after year after year. We were always hopeful that we were going to be able to beat the Mighty Blues, but we always left Lang Park very, very disappointed. So that provided pretty automatic motivation for myself and a lot of the other Queensland players when we faced the New South Wales fellows in State of Origin series. And it's become apparent now that a lot of the New South Wales supporters find it very, very hard to accept that Queensland have been state of origin champions for nine of the 12 years. We've beaten them again and again and again and still they refuse to admit that Queensland are champions. All of a sudden arrows were pointed at me. He's arrogant, he does this, he does that and people come up with their own reasons. I mean, in the space of two weeks, the rumours that were flying around town why I was sacked as, of the, as, as Broncos captain were absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it just about got to the point where I was responsible for a shotgun murder at one stage. But it, it was absolutely crazy. I was supposed to be in trouble with the police. All I wanted them to say was, if I was sacked, we've sacked him because he's not a good captain. And I don't believe that I was being a bad captain on the field. And I believe that any footballer should be judged by his performance or ability on the football field. If he's a good player or a good captain, then he gets credit for it. If he's not, well, he gets rejection. So if I wasn't a good captain, I just wanted them to say, hey, we think you're a bum captain, we don't want you anymore. Unfortunately, that wasn't the way it was done.
backyard games are often Queensland versus New South Wales. I think uh, my brothers always wanted to be New South Wales because New South Wales always beat Queensland. I loved being a Queenslander and hopefully I was going to beat them one day, but uh, I think those dreams I had were often the same dreams that the Queensland players in those days had. Perhaps we'll beat New South Wales this game. Will it ever happen? Those dreams often came true for me in the backyard when I, uh, when I did play against my brothers, but uh, they were three or four years younger than I was. And I just thought to myself, well, maybe it is a dream, but I've got to wait and find out whether I'm going to make it or not. The Lewis's family home in the working class suburb of Cannon Hill, where Wally's father, Jim, helped develop his legendary footballing skills. He was always in a hurry to do everything, Wally. Um, even when I was carrying him, uh, boy, did I know I was alive. I think he was kicking footballs in, actually. From the time Wally was born, we knew, you know that he's going to achieve something. Um, that's probably a big statement, but Jimmy gave him a, a number the day he was born, actually, in the hospital bed. He come up to me and he says, oh, I've got number eight picked out for him. That was an, and, you know, he wore that for many years. He was a lock. I played a bit in that position and uh, I thought it was the best position on the field. Well, you can please yourself what you do at lock forward those days. Uh, he was a sort of a rover sort of thing. And uh, I just liked the position and I thought, well, that's as good a position to play as any. You're not in the real heavy stuff. And, uh, well, you can get involved in it. But uh, that, that was just my idea. I thought it was an ideal position. We always used to have a, a time limit in the game, you know, that we were gonna, when we were going to finish, my sister would be the timekeeper and my brother scored a try with about uh, 30 seconds to go in this game. So after he scored the try, I said, hurry up and take the kick of goal, and I kicked off to him again. I thought, well, he's beaten me. I, I can't beat him here. And he ran, I picked him up, and I spear-tackled him, and he landed on the little foot-wide cement track that we had leading up to our clothesline. He snapped his collarbone and he started screaming and I said, if you go up and tell mum and dad I'm going to kill you, <laughs> don't go and tell him. So the poor bugger sat there for about uh, 15 minutes downstairs crying his eyes out and I said, it doesn't hurt that much, don't worry about it. Just sit there and he went upstairs and he watched about five minutes of the cartoons and mum kept saying to him, what's wrong with you? And he said, nothing, nothing. And uh, I just looked at him and you know, I just kept staring at him and <laughs> finally he couldn't take it anymore. He, he just burst into tears and uh, dad, dad came home and he had a look and he had his collarbone sticking up like that. They moved, removed his shirt and there was just a big V. Cannon Hill State School in 1966 where a freckle-faced young kid called Wally Lewis turned up with his Vegemite sandwiches and his old leather football. But then they started school, just up here at Cannon Hill State School. It was a flourishing school at that stage. I think there was something like 1,100 children there. Today, I think they'd be lucky if they had 300. <coughs> but certainly rugby league, that was the right school to go to. Uh, it was very competitive. <coughs> we were a sporting family. Um, it was as simple as that. Um, sport was actually first, in fact, when we went to school, the last thing of the morning was I heard their spellings outside the gate. Um, so I always made sure that they did. I did hear their spellings because I thought if they could read, write and add up, they'd get on all right in, in life. His boyhood achievements are told in the family's trophy room, lovingly put together by his mother, June. Every year went by without some form of recognition. In isolation, they're proud achievements, but collectively they represented the flower of genius that would, in years to come, embrace the league fans, thousands of them, in five nations. I had a lot of pride when I first pulled on a Cannon Hill 
jersey. It was the Cannon Hill Stars, and that was my local team. In those days, it was as good as representing a country because we were sort of a, an area that was a, a new area in Brisbane. It was a, a real working man's suburb. I got the opportunity to, to play for Cannon Hill, and uh, I went out there. But the thing was, I was playing rugby league. I was finally getting the chance to go out there and play the game that I'd seen so many great players have the opportunity to do so. I got out there and, uh, and played football for Cannon Hill, and I thought, well, this is it. I've, I've finally done it. I've played rugby league, and that's all I ever wanted to do. The referee pulled him aside. After the game, he came over, didn't he? He pulled him aside and said, listen, son, you're doing too much. Settle down. And, uh, but he was tackling, he was running, and he was kicking. He, that was his very first game. We remember that well, actually. I always wanted to impress my dad. He was the only one that I ever cared about playing good in front of because I knew that his criticism was always there to help me. Uh, I used to come off the field and run up and say, how'd I go, Dad? I, I went pretty well, didn't I? What did you think about that performance? And he was never too forward in, uh, in giving out uh, appraisals. Um, he used to sort of say, yeah, you, you did OK, you, you did that well and you did this well, but you missed three tackles. See what you can do next week. I don't want to see you miss three tackles. And the next time I ran on the field, I used to think, I can't miss three tackles. I used to have a real fear about missing three tackles. And I'd come home after playing a game where he didn't see me, and I used to say, oh, I scored three tries today, or I did this and I did that. His only question was, what did you do wrong? He always said he would never, ever play under me as a coach. And uh, I'd coached Winner May grade in 76, and Wally was playing, uh, uh, playing for Valleys, and the next year, uh, 77, uh, Valley's under 18s didn't have a coach and he asked me to put in for him and I got the job and I think I started off with about 14 players just, just before the season started and while he was uh, playing uh, Union for State High and uh, this particular night we were training our first before our first fixture match and Wally was the captain and uh, I said to him now I know you've got a team meeting I said, go to the team meeting. I said, I don't mind if you don't, if you don't train, but turn up. You've got to get there. So he didn't turn up. Anyway, I said a few words when I got home, but I let it drop to him. Then we were playing on the Friday night, I think it was our first game against the police. That was uh, Wayne Bennett's side. And uh, anyway, I had 14 players. So I handed out the 14 uh, jumpers, and Wally got his number eight and everything like that and everything was all right till I announced the side to go on the field and he wasn't in it oh and he performed and not so much to me because he knew that wouldn't have done him any good but uh, most, the mm. most of the officials he gave me a nice big bake too and uh, I thought that was lovely <laughs> I, I, enjoyed it. I know I've heard him see I didn't really dominate too much as an attacking player when I was a young fellow I think my my dad always impressed upon me most it was the defensive players that will always get uh, his praise. He was a, a first grade footballer himself and an A grade coach. And I remember he always used to, to tell his players, they missed so many tackles and they let in so many tries. That's what lost the, the game for the team. And I never, ever wanted to be the player that lost a game for my team. If I couldn't score a try, well, then fine. Some other players could do it. And I was one of the slowest players in, uh, in any team that I ever played for as a, as a youngster. I always used to think to myself, I only missed those two or three tackles, though. And it got harder and harder and harder to as I went through uh, junior football to try and cut down the mistakes I made and, and try and search for that game where you never, ever made a mistake. You didn't miss a tackle. And if you got through one of those games and thought, well, I did that, I didn't make any, any mistakes in the defensive line, then Dad would turn around and say, but how'd you go and attack? So it was always getting 100% in one area before you'd search for the, uh, for the perfect record in another. Wally wasn't your regular high school student. And that was evident in his report cards and his many trips to the headmaster's office. My memories of myself uh, at Brisbane State High were exactly the same, I suppose, as, as a lot of young kids had. They, were, they had a lot of two-bob mug in them. I came from a real working man's area. The Cannon Hill, a lot of the guys there were often uh, people that... Uh, their, their parents probably struggled to earn $150 a week in those days. Um, and, and my dad was, was no different. We were a real battling family. But uh, he never, you know, 
gave out excuses. He always used to say, you know, you've got to strive to, to achieve better. I went to school and I got into, uh, I got into trouble with teachers at Brisbane State High from day one. The very first day I was at school, I was in a fight. I got an absolute hiding. But uh, I, I sort of came home and I thought, yeah, you know, I'm the tough guy at school. I've, I've done well now. But, no, we, we didn't really have a lot of trouble with Wally, except... No, well, Wally... I didn't know till later in life. He had a few problems when he went to high school, but they never, ever told me until... I've only learnt about it the last couple of years. I always thought he was a pretty good lad, but a couple of the stories I've heard since... Yeah, well, he was got in a bit of trouble. Like, all boys get in a bit of trouble. They're all boys, and... Of course, he, he come to me, and... Uh, uh, we fixed everything up. There was no need for Mum to know, so... It was just he had a couple of smokes at school when he shouldn't have. I can remember one particular incident where, uh, where the teachers used to... One year in particular where the teachers had a lot of fun in cutting me back to size was my final year in high school. Uh, we thought we were pretty good being in the first 11 cricket and the first 15 football and you could walk around like you were 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And suddenly... The teachers used to have fun and, and saying, hey, listen, come here, you think you're this and that, and chop you right back down to size. And in particular, the principal, on my last day at high school, sort of said to me, well, congratulations on your success. I was going away with the Australian Schoolboys Rugby Union team. Good luck on the tour. Uh, I haven't really enjoyed being associated with you here at school and see you later. And he kind of swept me out of the, out of the office get out of the way type of thing and uh, the same bloke about three years later I came across him at the Brisbane Cricket Ground and I had just been selected in the Queensland Rugby League team and he came up to me and said oh look it's great to see you one of my former students come here I'd like to introduce you to a lot of my old mates and I looked at you and I said you you're kidding I wouldn't be seen dead with you and I just walked away from him and <laughs> I think that was uh, that was a little bit of getting back from the times that I didn't enjoy. Uh, I never ever told my mum, but I used to be forced to go up to the office every Monday morning to get two cuts in my final year, two strokes of the cane in my final year at school, just to keep me in tow, just to, to let me know that uh, I was being looked at and made sure that I was towing the line. The year is 1977. It's the Australian Rugby Football Schools Union side, known as the Invincibles, sweeping all before them on a world tour. Eleven went on to represent their country at senior level. And Wally Lewis, arguably their brightest star. There was Michael O'Connor, Michael Hawker, Tony Melrose, of course, the great Mark Eller and his brilliant brothers Glenn and Gary. I th think my first opportunity that I really had to appreciate what Rugby Union offered me and what playing for Australia gave to me was when I went away with the Australian Schoolboys Rugby Union team in 1977. I had the opportunity to play with some magnificent footballers on that tour. The Yellow Brothers uh, were, with, were three of the blokes on tour that probably received the most publicity. Michael O'Connor was a player, Michael Hawker, Chris Roach, Tony Darcy. The, the list is endless of the players that were successful on that tour. But it gave me the opportunity to go away with a group of, of very talented footballers and exchange ideas see how the other players used to handle certain events on a football field. And that, to me, probably was worth five or ten years' experience. I used to watch and marvel at the, the abilities of, of the Yellow Brothers, and a lot of people used to argue, who was the more talented in those days? Was it Mark or Glenn? And I had a very good relationship with Gary Ella, who I played in the centres alongside, and I often thought that Gary, if they had a change to league, the three of them, Gary probably would have been the most successful league player. He was, was a fellow that really fitted in along the, uh, the rugby league guidelines. Mark and Glenn, though, were just two absolute freaks. They were magicians with the football, but fellows that, that could adapt to any sport. We went away on the tour, and for three months, we had 27, 28 schoolboys stuck together. And that could get fairly boring. And in one RAF base in, uh, in the south of Wales, we were stuck together and it was cold and wet and it was Christmas going on New Year time. We missed our families and girlfriends. We wanted to go home. But we just got stuck in an RAF base and there probably weren't many worse places to be. But uh, the fellows stuck together and we all bought uh, table tennis tables and, uh, and snooker tables just to, to bide time with. And that was uh, probably the time when I realised how freakish the Yellow Brothers were. They'd never played table tennis before. Within three days, they were thrashing everybody that uh, had ever played table tennis before. And I used to play a lot. We had a table at our house and probably had five or six years' experience. 
was no match for Mark or Glen Ella. They, uh, they absolutely whipped a lot of us. They were whipping guys in, uh, in snooker. Anything we decided to play, cricket, whatever it was, and that gave me a, a chance to appreciate the talents and ball skills that these guys had. And um, I still now look back and regard Mark Eller as probably the most gifted f footballer and probably the, the most gifted ball sports player that I've ever seen. But it was in league and not union where his destiny would lie and a pro career of unparalleled success and controversy. You talk about Bradman and you talk about Walter Lindrum and you talk about Dawn Fraser. I think you can talk about Wally Lewis. You talk about Kingston Town. I remember the famous call of the term in the third WS Cox Plate, the Weight Frage Championship of the World, and they said Kingston Town's gone. And Kingston Town won his third Cox Plate. They said Lewis was gone, he kept on giving. So he's amongst, really, I think, the immortals. That's not overstating it. And when people have that kind of ability, you've got to expect they're going to bob up somewhere else. You don't just sign them off. skills as if they were just technical skills. I mean, obviously, he throws a pass beautifully. He knows when to kick. I mean, that skill is judgment. So he's not just got the natural ability, because a lot of players have got that. There are heaps of players most probably kick better than Wally Lewis, perhaps pass to the right better than Wally Lewis, not perhaps to the left. They certainly run faster than Wally Lewis. They're stronger. They mostly probably tackle and hurt more than Wally Lewis. But it's what he does with them. He seems to be using the appropriate skill more often at the right time than any other contemporary player. There's Lewis, that's the first approach to the tackle. In comes Elry Hanley, and they've all giving him plenty. But yes, well, yes, still going, and Wally keeps going. And we'll see, that's a try. Yep, that's a fair... Well, the one thing he has got, he's a winner, and he's, he's a player that just goes out and... I mean, I saw him play a game in, in 1988, the third test against Great Britain at the Sydney Football Stadium, and uh, the players were falling down as far as their form goes all around him, and I thought that was one of the best games I've seen the man play, and it was in a losing side, and he really, really, really pushed it and pushed it to the hilt, and uh, as I said, there was a lot of other big-name players that just didn't give him the support that he, he should have got in that particular game, because if, if they all played the way Wally did, and that was the best, to the best of his ability, well, they would have won that particular test. Here's a little chip kick by Lewis. He's regathered. He's got Strudwick inside. He's still going. Still going as uh, Lewis puts a little grubber kick. He's out after it. He could be the first one there. I reckon he'll win the race. No, knew it is. And it's a tie. The first game that we had that year was against Valleys. And um, it was a big shock to me because I'd coached the top side over in Auckland and we'd been used to winning. And the Norse had run last the year before and we'd lost a lot of players and it was only a new young side. But that's when I saw Wally. And uh, from memory, I think they beat us by over 30 points. Might have been 35 points or something they beat us by. But Wally Lewis, he was just, like, I, I couldn't believe it, just watching him play. Uh, at that stage, he was playing lock, but he was just a sensational player. And he, he just, you know, he, he was magic back in those times. And, and I, I thought he was, I, I, I thought he was the very best, but years, as years went by, he showed he was even going to be better. Lewis away over the quarter line. He's coming up the fullback, Belcher. Takes a tackle, but gets through it and is over. Valley's looking for the try to seal it up. Wally Lewis, desperation stakes, but away it goes, and there's a try for Carrotten. To um, McQuirter, McQuirter to Lewis. Lewis put a little kick, regathered, still going. Kellaway's at him. He got away from Kellaway. Sends it back to McQuirter, and he'll race away, and he's over underneath the post. On most occasions. Back it goes to Lewis, bustling up the centre. He's coming up to Kilroy's away from Kilroy, and he'll score. Lewis is in.
when he came into grade football in 78 with Valleys, uh, he quickly stamped that mark of class uh, on his football. Uh, but he also was a, was a player who was a little bit different. Um, I think he was a little bit aloof as a person. Uh, I recall at quite a few uh, end of season functions, best player awards, that sort of thing. Wally never quite was one of the lads. He, uh, he stood in a corner often with a small circle of friends. And uh, I don't think it was a deliberate thing, but I think like many class sportsmen, he was perhaps a little single-minded and wanted to run his own race. When he first came into it, well, you know, he, he ran it a lot because him and Struddy, you know, created havoc for Valleys in the early days, especially Wally with his chip kick and regather and setting up play. But as he got older, he started using his head a lot more. And um, to the rest of us in the team, you know, it didn't really matter that much because he was always one, two, three steps ahead of everyone. And um, to me, you know, that's what made him the great player he is. He was just so far ahead of everyone else. I thought playing first grade football to me was just about the end of the road. That's all I ever wanted to do. I thought, I think a lot of guys around about that age then too, when we were 18, just coming into grade football, thought that you had to be some sort of superhuman to play for your country or even your state. And uh, when I played first grade football, I thought, well, that's it. You know, I've arrived here. If, if I get to play first grade football for the rest of my life, that'll do me. Um, I was very lucky. I had a, a, quite a, I suppose, lucky opening to a first grade career, I was playing in a side that uh, uh, was just about to become one of the real strengths in the Brisbane competition. It was captained uh, by Ross Strudwick, who certainly helped me a lot. And uh, all I did in my first A-grade game was do what I was told. He told me where to run, and I scored three tries in that game. Lewis away over the quarter line. He's coming up the full-back, Belcher. Takes the tackle, the six is over. He's ended up winning the, or being in the grand final team. It's uh, well and truly won. Boy, oh boy, what a score. Wayne Bennett walking about there, Malma Nigger in the background, the Sharks players absolutely stunned. The one thing they'd love to do would be away from there, but give them the due mick, they've stayed there. That's the grand final for 1984. Disappointing from a crowd spectacle, although if you win and support it, it was beautiful. So the full-time score, we see Winner Manly defeating South by 42 points to eight. There's Wally. I'd be telling a lie if I said Lang Park wasn't my favourite ground. It's a ground that I've enjoyed playing on ever since my first time. I played there in 1967 as a four-stone schoolboy in the grand final there. We were victorious on that occasion. And it was one of those grounds where I thought, well, I want to be part of this for a long, long time. That's where all the Brisbane football was played. If a team was any good, they always played at Lang Park. The match of the day was always there. And I suppose by the time I got to play for Queensland the very first time, I'd probably had 40 or 50 matches on Lang Park. Now, 10 years, 12 years later, I've had the opportunity to play in Lang Park probably 200 times. And some commentators are a little bit funny when they say Lewis knows every blade of grass on Lang Park. Well, that, that may, uh, may sound funny, I suppose, at times, but in reality, it, it's pretty much true. When you get out in Lang Park, you, uh, you see that it's, it's very much a curved field. Curved field, it, it curves to the sidelines. And if you kick a ball towards the edge of the field, it's naturally going to run downhill. And a lot of people say, hey, Lewis knows that corner of the field, it runs down. It's only common sense. If you kick the football there, it's naturally going to run down the field and go out. But uh, some of the, uh, the moments I've enjoyed of the field uh, are amongst the greatest of my life. And uh, it's, it's a place that will always hold a, a very special place in my football memories.
beats it on the blind. Back inside to Lewis. Turns it away to Oliphant. They're moving nicely. Smith, Meninga, close. Close. Gets it away to Boosted. This could be the try they're after. Yes, it is. He's over. Running around and Boosted is in. Wales quarter line, you can see. This is Johnny Lang. Beats him up the centre. Back to Lang. Sends it away to Meninga. Meninga to close. Close cutting back the other way. Catches the fence on the wrong foot. He's broken through. He's coming up to Edie. Gets away from Edie. He's over underneath. Chris Close. Great piece of work. The memories I have of my first State of Origin game at Lang Park uh, are many. Probably the best one I've got is actually being uh, grabbed by Arthur Beetson before we, we went out onto the ground and Arthur pulled me aside into a corner and he could see the nerves uh, from a mile away. I was standing alongside some of the greatest players in history and playing against some of the best. And Beetson uh, dragged me into the corner and he said, listen, mate, you've got a little bit of talent. He said, I've spoken to the players up here and they tell me you can play. Just go out there and do your best, whatever you do. Just try your best. So I walked out onto the football field, very nervous, of course, and was introduced to the crowd one by one, and then the noise came when Arthur Beetson was introduced to the crowd. And Queensland's had many victories since that day at Lang Park, but I still don't think I've ever heard such a noise come out of the outer of Lang Park. It was absolutely deafening. Queensland's favourite son of all time was finally home to represent his state. Tackling won the Queensland big... Ooh, gee, there's a big one by Wynn. Beetson no, came at him. Actually, uh... It was Greg Oliphant that put the first one in, and a niggly little one, and it's in. It's on for young and old now, breaking up in various directions. Oh. Chris Close put Alan Thompson down. And there's players going in all directions. Still, it's Morris. And uh, oh, look at that. going on. They're still going. Oliphant moving put in at Rogers. They're coming in everywhere. And still, this huge melee of players. I'll tell you what, Oliphant... My motivation was centred around the fact that Virtually uh, New South Welshman or the cockroaches, as Barry Muir likes to refer them as, uh, uh, were the silver tails and uh, we were the fibro dwellers, so we were the underdogs and we really needed no motivation. Then away to Beetson, works it on to Lewis. Lewis dummies trying to find a way up the centre but tagged over there by Rogers. Lewis over there from one side, Beetson's into it too and they'll bowl him back a couple of metres. Queensland defeated New South Wales by I don't think I, I played a very good game at all that night. I, I think I was absolutely starstruck. I ran alongside Arthur probably three quarters of the game. Didn't manage to get very, very many opportunities. But after the game, I suppose I could console myself in the fact that uh, Queensland had won and I'd finally had the opportunity to play alongside one of the greatest players of all time. Could have been wrestled out of his hands by Lewis. We'll wait for Thompson. Yes, a Queensland ball. You could see then that he, he was a budding champion and the same the next year when I was captain coach of Queensland. I also uh, had the pleasure of playing against Wally in club football in Brisbane and uh, there was no doubt he was destined for the Stars. Here's Lewis, he's on the go. Beautiful stuff, Wally Lewis inside to Mark Murray. He's going for that line. Hunt is at him but Hunt will put him down. Here's Morton, still going. Lewis outside, he's over underneath the post. First try of the match after only four minutes of play. He'll go himself. But he'll go Lewis looked around everywhere and then decided to take it and go. Lewis is not agreeing with what has happened. He's saying Kaneski's had the ball. He's had the ball, says Wally. He's had the ball, says Wally. Rubber. Lewis. McIndoe. McIndoe's got the speed. He should have the speed. Jack. Jack. That's gone forward. Will he test his strength? He does. He does. If there's a try, Bacco, he's in. Lewis has created it again. Watch this. He's in trouble. One, two, three. Three defenders, and he pulls them all in. Now it's with Lewis. On his own. Wally Lewis to score. Oh, he's left them dumbfounded. Lewis showed them the ball. Here it is. He's dummy to Curry. Off on his own. Straight through. Well, the State of Origin fixtures are amongst the greatest forums for competitive sport that the world of sport has ever seen. I mean, OK, you have your Super Bowl and all that stuff, which I'm not enamoured of. They're all uh, padded up and only a couple of people are involved in the play. And it is America and there's plenty of hype. But, I mean, this is genuinely tough stuff. And the thing that is the central attractive point about it 
is that it's unstructured. It's a spontaneous playing of the sport by people who most probably for the rest of the year are highly structured with coaches telling them what they can't do, not what they can do. Now, you haven't got time to do this. They're picked from different clubs. There's 13 of them, 15 of them. A coach has a couple of days to most probably establish a couple of strategies, whether we're going to play it down there or up there and whether we ruck it early or whether we kick it. But beyond that, it's saying, well, listen, fellas, you're not here if you haven't got ability. Away you go. And that's where Lewis was at his best because he could mobilise that talent. People like to be able to express it. And if you thought that you were the right man to be taking the ball, while he was saying, you take it, and when you're finished with it, give it to me and I'll do something with it. I mean, they are fantastic. And uh, I don't know, perhaps Lewis has a particular place and all that because we're talking about a decade of them and he's been in the lot. New South Wales have it. Last tackle coming up. We'll probably see the bomb again. Mortimer, up it goes. Up above the pack they fly, that's a try. New South Wales looking dangerous, they're back up to the quarter way. Ben Elias goes from dummy half, he's through, he splits them all, and a great try. Ben Elias goes in to score under the post. It was Pat Jarvis, as John Rebo has to do some running repairs in back play, having lost his shoe as it comes to Chris Close. Close trying to get past Ferguson, got it to Shearer, then it goes away to Murray. Murray gets it away to Bobby Linda. Linda will go in and score. That's a great try. Queenslander back in business. Greg Kineskew, a one-handed pass back to Lewis. This time Lewis elects to run and run, he does. Into the open goes Wally Lewis. He's looking for support. He's got Rebo outside of him. He's still running. He's brought down just one metre out. Back to Lewis. Away to Meninga. Can Meninga unload? Back to Lewis. Across to Dave Brown. Brown up the centre. Can't get his pass back. Eight metres out. Kineskew. On to Dowling. Dowling decides to run. Trying to get past Cleal. Back inside it goes to Ian French. Is he over? He is. He's there. Back it goes for the field goal attempt by Michael O'Connor. It's there. New South Wales is back in front. Mortimer. Gets his pass away to Brett Kenny. Kenny sneaking through. He's over. He's put it down. That's it. That's the ball game. The tough thing about Wally Lewis was when you came up against him. Um, he was the player in 99% of the... Well, out of the 18 State of Origin matches I played, um, 17 State of Origin... 17 of those State of Origin matches, he was the man whom we had to stop. The other State of Origin, he was out injured. So... <laughs> Uh, he was the man that really ignited the, the, the state of origin for Queensland. He was a guy that set them on fire. Here's to Wally Lewis for lacing on a boot. Sometimes he plays it rugged, sometimes he plays it cute. He slices through a back line like a Stratbroke Island shark. There's blue on all his fingers. He's the emperor of Lang Park. It is like the Coliseum. You know, it's like the gladiators out in the middle of the field with, you know, with, with the spectators just burning for action. And, and that's the way it feels out there. And when the Blues come up here to try and make a show, they go back scratching their heads saying, which way did he go? I can remember leaving the Park Royal Hotel uh, on a bus heading to the ground. We had a police escort because the, the traffic was phenomenal. Uh, going towards the ground, we went past a, a pub on a hill uh, I think it's called the Caxton at the back of Lang Park there, and it was bumper to bumper traffic. And we've just pulled up outside the hotel, and people the pub was full. There were people spewing out onto the footpaths, and one of the guys drinking on the footpath recognised New South Wales in the bus, so they proceeded to scull their drinks and throw their their cans at the bus. I mean, that was this is my very first state of origin heading to Lang Park. The game hadn't even started. The next time he goes over there to educate the palm, perhaps he'll teach a few to sing. I can feel the forex coming on. I can feel the forex coming on. It, I know the old cliche of they grow 10 feet when they put the, the maroon jersey on out at Lang Park, but it just seems to be, I mean, they just seem to be uh, unaffected by anything, you know. You can throw Sirin and Roach at, them at 100 miles. They'll stand there. Langer will get out and throw his whole body on, on the line for them. And that's the way that's the way it is out there. And I, whether it be the euphoria or, or, of just the build-up of Lang Park, I don't know. But this is, just, you know, I, I think the records would speak for themselves: wins and losses at Lang Park for the Queenslanders. It is 
is unbelievable. I mean, if you said kill, they'll kill. It's, it's you know, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's overdoing it. But, I mean, for each other, for each other, it, that's really what... It's not for themselves, it's for each other. I mean, whatever they get out of it is a bonus. It's a plus. Uh, I mean, Australian... Everybody wants to play for Australia. Everybody wants to be an Australian side. But all these, all these players, all these Queenslanders... They just want to beat New South Wales. Blow away the blues tonight. Can you feel it? Gonna play tough. Gonna play strong. Can you feel a big win coming on? I get into trouble here because having lived in New South Wales for a long time, but I am a Queensland and I was born on the Darling Downs. Now you're asking me what you get out of it. What you get out of it is the fact that you become a Queenslander straight away. <laughs> Isn't it a terrible thing to say? But in the sense because you're living and working down here, not terrible to be a Queenslander, but you're actually living with people. And, and last year as coach of Balmain, I mean, Benny, one of my players, was the captain and I desperately wanted him to do well and the team to do well, but I really was a Queenslander with this enormous maroon heart <laughs> pulsating and beating. So it just, that's what it does to you, doesn't it? I mean, it makes you stop. You cancel programs. You sit there at night. There's a, you talk about it the day before. You talk about it the day after. It's bigger than the Melbourne Cup. When the guys first joined together in the hotel camp, they really bond as one team unit. It's a family-type atmosphere. Everybody wants to play for Queensland. It's not so much play for themselves, play for their state and play for their own honour. It's play for Queensland. And I think a lot of the, lot of the success uh, for Queensland is owed to games played 15 and 20 years ago where Queensland were belted year in and year out and were embarrassed by New South Wales. Suddenly we had the chance to get out there and know that we could beat New South Wales. And Fatty Vorton used to epitomise it more than any other player when we were playing for Queensland. When we were doing it tough, the players would look to each other and say, hey, the hell, there's still 10 minutes to go here. We've got no petrol left in the tank. What are we going to do? New South Wales are starting to run over the top of us. You turn and look to the, the rest of the teammates alongside you and say, come on, guys, we've got to bond together. And Fatty had always come up with a cry, Queenslander. It's great to be a Queenslander. And suddenly, out of all the, the tired-looking faces, a little bit of energy would spring and guys would get a little bit more excited and say, Queensland, it would become infectious. And one would go on to another, on to another, and suddenly you had 13 players screaming Queenslander with Gary Belcher at the back, and he was just like the conductor of the orchestra, just screaming it out time after time after time. And this would go on for probably eight or ten minutes. And when guys really stuck together that closely, that shows you just how much team spirit can lift a team's performance. Once again. The try I managed to score in that particular game holds a very special moment in my life for me. It was something that I felt uh, pretty good about and I certainly celebrated after the try in no uncertain terms. But to me, that, uh, that try was brought about by an example of discipline and, and guts and courage by another bloke that received very, very little credit for his involvement in that try. Now, at, the sta at that stage, New South Wales had the ball. They brought a ruck out from their own line. They were probably about 20, 22 metres out from their line. And Trevor Gilmeister ran in at, ran in at about 120 kilometres an hour and hit one of the New South Wales forwards with one of the hardest tackles I've ever experienced in state of origin football. The ball came loose. Michael Hagen picked it up and just shot it out to me. Under those sort of circumstances, that's the best idea. If there's nothing on in that particular area of the field where you're standing, 
get the ball out a little bit wider. Perhaps there's an opportunity out there. The ball came my way, and to be very honest, I don't know why I decided to, to run and take that angle. Maybe there was a little bit of a gap there. Thinking back on it, I, I can notice that I've, I've had a look up and spied a little bit of a hole, and I decided to run. In times like that, though, it's, it's just up to your own determination and your own judgment whether you're going to make it, and I decided that I was going to have a go. Um, I got into the clear, and there was one guy to beat, which was Gary Jack, and Gary, of course, is one of the finest fullbacks Australia has ever produced. He had the disadvantage, though, of, of playing after his arm was broken a few months earlier. I decided that he was the guy I was going to take on because I knew just how much inconvenience a broken arm can cause. about Wally Lewis. Anytime some sort of magic needs to be done, whether it's pulling rabbits out of the hat or just shrugging off tacklers or showing some pace, Wally Lewis does it at the right time. He was dead set going to be tackled there, but nope, New South Wales, no answer. It is warfare now between New South Wales and Queensland and uh, it's all about state supremacy and, you know, Queensland for our, you know, the part we've played the last decade, we've been the dominating team and we want to keep it that way and we want to make sure that um, every time we go on the, on the football field against the New South Wales team that we're going to play to our potential. And if we do that, and uh, particularly with the Lang, Lang Park crowd behind us, uh, we're you know, more than likely going to win that game. And the Blues on. It's all on now. And Queensland on. skipper Wally Lewis was sent to the sin bin by referee Mick Stone for inciting the brawl. The Emperor's fans were infuriated and let loose with a shower of beer cans, most empty, some full. Police were powerless to stop the bombardment. I can distinctly remember Mark McGaw, who was playing in one of his uh, earlier State of Origin matches, came over to me and he said, he said, Junior, because I was captain, he said, are we going to stay on here? I said, what do you mean? He said, the cricketers walked off. He said, are we staying on here? He was really, really shaking. But um, now we settled down and, and finished the match. It is almost as though, uh, though uh, Wally Lewis uh, was... Um born to be part of this uh, concept that, that is the state of origin uh, uh, competition. Uh, uh, while he came along, or, or while he hit his straps as it were, uh, virtually when the, uh, at the outset of the, the team's competition, and uh, it wasn't just the fact that while he had the ability, while he also had the personality, he also had the uh, presence but probably more importantly, uh, it, at that young age, and none of us knew how good Wally Lewis was going to be either, uh, Wally had this tremendous uh, loyalty uh, to Queensland that was really, uh, and this, this loyalty was generated and the spirit towards the team was a spin-off of this. nervous. I wasn't nervous at all the whole day. Um, it went very quickly. There was a lot of uh, media there as well, but we had lots and lots of friends. We had 200 in the guests, so there was a lot of people to get round to. It was nice when we actually got back to the um, Sheridan where we stayed, and then we happened to have to watch the union that night because the union test was on. So we happened to watch Mark. We had to watch Mark and um, Ella on TV and because uh, Mark couldn't make it to our wedding and uh, him and his brothers had sent a no, uh, telegram to say that they couldn't. No, it was a wonderful day. It's, there's been four lovely occasions in my life, my wedding and my three children. My own family's been a tower of strength to me. There's been a lot of trying times over the last couple of years, but uh, in particular the last uh, six to 12 months really have been very testing. Uh, my daughter was pronounced profoundly deaf that in itself is not such a great problem to us. Um, she's a terrific little kid and displays a lot of bravery herself and is a, is, is a ball of fun to be around. My two sons are, uh, are great little kids. They, um, they get to spend a fair bit of time with me during the off-season. 
they just can't understand, you know, why I've got to spend so much time associated with football. But when I do get to spend time with them, it is real quality time. We do everything that they want to do, and I like to give them the best of what I possibly can. And in saying that, I, I probably want to give them the same opportunities that, that my parents gave me. We first thought that there was a problem, and then we, I went to the doctor. This was um, about four days before she turned one, and he then started to believe me. I mean, I've been to many doctors, but by this stage... Um, they did start to believe me, even though, as my paediatrician said, she was so quick with her eye movement, like any movement, she'd just spin around to it, that it was really hard to detect that she had a hearing problem. They thought it was just a small hearing problem, so they said to me, OK, we'll put it straight in and we'll give her grommets and that will fix it. And I said, well, you know, she, I don't think she hears anything. But um, they said, well, that's all right. You know, that's how some children react. I said, oh, OK, well, that's fine, you know. I mean, she had went and said, Dad, Dad, honest and everything. I know now that she was lip reading and it was just noise coming out of her mouth. She's had to put up with all of the disappointments. She was there to share the disappointments uh, with Jamie Lee's deafness. But she's been alone a lot of the times when uh, a lot of the criticism has been uh, levelled at me by different uh, parties around the country and on other sides of the Tasman. She, a lot of the time, has, there, has been there by herself. I mean, to me, a, a lot of that stuff is water off a duck's back and it really doesn't upset me whatsoever, but quite often I'll, I'll ring Jack and she'll be in tears on the phone and she doesn't uh, handle it quite as well as I do, but a lot of the time when I've had to share moments of disappointment, she's made them a lot easier to bear. Yeah, actually, well, there was one incident um, up at Cannon Hill and we used to always go back and do our shopping at Cannon Hill, even though we lived down, started to move down to Birkdale and the Cleveland area. We'd still go back and do our shopping at Cannon Hill because that was where Wally's shop used to be and that's where we knew everybody. And I happened to... I always walk usually up a different aisle than Wally because he's a bit slow when we go shopping. He loves grocery shopping. So in your always hear these people, they guess Wally does, they guess Wally does. Anyway, I heard one of the young girls say something um, like, oh, you know, Wally's a wanker. And she was a shop assistant and she walked back into the fruit and veg. So I followed her and I wasn't going to have that. If I need to hear that, I can go to Sydney. You know, I don't need to hear it in my own state about someone she didn't know. She didn't know that at all. Um, and I explained that to her and uh, I don't think she'll say it again. <laughs> The names have always flowed pretty thick and fast in Sydney. There have never been too many complimentary ones, that's for sure. I ran out and, uh, you know, there's always been the banners, uh, Wally sucks and Wally's a wanker. And in a way, that used to make me feel pretty good. I knew that, uh, that I had the people against me. And whenever I went to Sydney, I knew that I was going to be at my best in, uh, in an interstate clash because... I automatically, as soon as I got to the ground, I knew that I was going to be switched on to play football. i walk into the ground and people would scream abuse at me and that would always ensure that I was in the right frame of mind. The only time that it ever really got to me, I mean, the chant used to go on while he's a wanker from one end of the ground and the other end of the field would be chanting while he sucks and Paul Vaught would be out next to me on the football field and uh, he'd be sort of uh, using some gestures with his hand that would make me have a bit of a giggle. But... The only time that it used to annoy me, really annoy me, was when the National Anthem came on. I used to take a great deal of pride, and still do, in singing the National Anthem, whether it's before a club game or an interstate or international game. I believe that when the National Anthem is on, then everything else stops and you sing your National Anthem if you've got a bit of pride in your country. But it seemed, uh, down there anyway, that they had more, uh, more people interested in singing the Sydney National Anthem, which was Wally's a wanker or Wally sucks. The Australian Rugby League team to play against the touring French side has been announced in Sydney and includes the dynamic Queenslander Wally Lewis. Also in the squad... These Australians certainly don't run in ones. There's people backing up off them all the time. Oh, good long ball. And he's in. Malman Inga. 40 pass. Well, the most special moments in my life, the ones I like to remember most, are the, are the times that I represented my country. The first time being probably the, the most special 
and the time when I first heard I was going to be captain of Australia. I can remember I was sitting at home with my wife after I was announced as captain of my country. And my wife remembers it better than I do, but she often reminds me that she came in and I was looking at a map of Australia. It was in a magazine or a paper or something. And I turned around to her and I said, I'm captain of the greatest country in the world. How good does that make me feel? Lewis, Miles, his teammate from Queensland, Lindner. Lindner for Lewis. Lewis for the line. That's a Queensland back up. The referee's over. Has he awarded the try? It's a try to Wally Lewis. You hear different stories before you take over. I know I was apprehensive when I first took over the job and I, the, the, no, I made a few inquiries, but when I got with Wally and... Uh, I had Peter Sterling as a vice captain on the Kangaroo Tour, but all the test matches, Wally Lewis is just a true professional and he uh, just loves to win. And when you have that sort of a captain under your wing, uh, you can't help be successful. I, I can't speak more highly than Wally Lewis. Uh, I know at times he might have trod on his own foot a few times uh, and he's probably wished he hadn't have done a few things, but you're talking to me as a captain, as a footballer and as a man as far as relationship between coach and player. And I just couldn't couldn't put a, a better adjective to say he was magnificent. First sign of the true taste of typical North England weather as the morning training session gets underway. Stand by for the national anthem of Australia. there, not giving themselves any depth. They need to stand a lot deeper. Out to Sterling. Sterling away there with a cutout pass to Lewis. Pops a pass back inside to Miles. Miles looking for support. Gets it away to O'Connor and he's in for the try. Out they go, the Australians. Out to Lewis. Lewis steps, weaves. Busts the tackle. Gets a pass away to Miles. And Miles is in beside the post. And Wally Lewis has created a magnificent try for Gene Miles who's gone over and scored right beside the post. Simmons a dummy half. On to Sterling. Sterling gets a pass to Lewis. Lewis is on the stand and he's over. Right underneath the black dot. That's the place to score him. Get their hand. We are the boys you know of. Russia. We show them how to play. No matter where it will be. The green and gold you'll see. When I first took over, I said, oh, how come you fell out? in 1982 uh, with Frank Stanton. He said, I didn't like the way, you tra the way he trained. He said he didn't way like the way I trained. And I said, well, I don't either. But I, I judge you on my, how you play. And I said, as far as I'm concerned, if you do the work of training and you play well, uh, I can't ask for more than that. And he said, that's fair enough. And I never had any trouble. Another time I thought he was just putting on a little weight. I said, how about doing a bit of extra? And he said, yes. And then he used to run home from training for the next week in England. So he was, as I said, he was just so professional. And when he, uh, I think the motivation is he just likes to be successful. And that's personally and also with the teams he's associated with. He, uh, you know, he's just one of those fellas. And he, you know, I'm, if he didn't think I was saying enough to the players, he'd chip in and, and, and give them a bit of a boost along himself. So he was just... As I said, great for me as being a coach with a fellow like that. The 1982 tour for me was a very proud moment for me. I was named as vice captain of the touring side. When we got over there, though, it was also the source of a little bit of disappointment. I wasn't included in the first test lineup. I was hauled aside by the coach, Frank Stanton, who was very disappointed, he said, in my form so far. He said that I'd obviously spoken to somebody who'd been on a previous tour that had told me, don't let a good tour interfere with a good time. I think we'd been away for around about 20 days and I'd put on a stone and three pound in that stage or around about six or seven kilos in the, in the new terms. So I'd, uh, I'd been doing training uh, pretty tough, put it that way. I had to turn around and work very hard at trying to get back in the side. It was uh, some good performances. And I, I, I don't say, I say that without reservation, actually, because I tried very, very hard to get that spot back. I was quite pleased with the way I'd managed to play in some of the games over there. And the conditions weren't really helping a lot of the Australians who were struggling to get in the test lineup. I managed to get back in there, but uh, it certainly took a lot, of, uh, a lot of trying. Now, a lot of Queensland people said Stanton's the coach 
and Sterling and Ray Price are in the side. That's the end for Lewis. He's finished. You won't see him in the test lineup. So they thought interstate jealousy was the reason that I wasn't in the first test lineup. But I can tell you in all honesty, the only reason why I didn't get in that first test lineup was because of the superior form shown by Brett Kenny. Kenny's going to go in. It's rather pathetic. It's rather pathetic. Often sitting on the bench in a football game allows you the opportunity to see some opportunities that few players get the chance to see. I came onto the field through an injury to Eric Groth. I got on there and went to halfback and uh, a few players in the back line shuffled around in their positions and it was strange to see Mel Meninga shifted out onto the wing. Neither of us really said too much. He looked at me and I looked at him and he just sort of raised his finger in the air as if I want the ball and the pass happened. It floated, it went through the air and fortunately it hit the mark on Big Mel's chest and he went across to score. Ball left behind by McCabe. The referee allowing play on as Lewis has come away. Was a knock on, but Kenny will go on with this. Kenny's beaten one, two, and he's in for a try. But he one handed to Wayne Pierce. Pierce goes through, right through the middle. Looks for support. Scott Ready there. Should be a try to Rebo. Rebo goes, and he's in. Ray Young sprinting away. Wayne Pierce will score a try. So look at him go. The referee might tackle him, but that's the only one. Up to Kenny, Rogers leaves it behind, back to Kenny, now then to uh, the fullback. Oh, Reddy cuts in for a try. To me, the biggest difference between the Australian and Great Britain sides since the mid-70s to the mid-80s was the fitness level achieved by both teams. Now, when we went there in 1982, our team were very, very strictly disciplined in the fitness area by Frank Stanton. We trained twice a day at least for two hours each session, and three quarters of that would have been uh, involved in, in, involving fitness work. The Great Britain side, when we played them in that first test, it became apparent even before the, the kickoff that the two fitness levels between the teams were vastly different. They had three players that were well over 30 years of age. One fellow was closer to 40 than he was 30. Our guys were all, or mostly, young, very, very fit guys and very trim. Now, a lot of the English fellows were, as some of the Australian players tagged them, early Santa Clauses. <laughs> second half it had become apparent that the English believed that they really could win that match after being beaten or flogged in one of the games and beaten quite convincingly in another they really wanted to win that game to salvage some pride for their country What I had to do more than anything else was try and lift the spirits of our players. Our guys were, were thinking about going home, the series was finished. We'd won, won it anyway after the first two test matches. Why was this match so important? So I turned around and I grabbed Gene Miles and Brett Kenny and Greg Dowling and I said, look, a few of the guys here have just lost a little bit of interest. We're going to have to try and revitalise them. Let's start taking some rucks up. Let's get us going forward again. All we're doing is going backwards.
Things that you do with the football that you don't really know you're doing. I threw about three or four dummies, and apparently the winger must have been a little bit fooled by this. And I decided to step inside. I saw the cover come across, the last line of cover, and stepped inside him and took off as quick as I could. I knew that I was going to get over the try line at that stage, and I just heard one of the English players dive to the ground behind me, screaming out, no, no, no. In 87 and the formation of the Brisbane Broncos. A bittersweet time for King Wally. He's at last in the Sydney competition, but his relationship with the Broncos and its coach Wayne Bennett is not a happy one. Playing the greatest rugby league comp in the world, and I think a lot of the guys that were playing in the Broncos team at that stage felt exactly the same way. We were able to stay at home, yet we had players of the calibre of Gene Miles and Greg Dowling in the team, players that were of uh, good quality as any other player in the competition throughout the world. I loved the opportunity of getting involved. The first match was a dream start for the Broncos. But that quickly, of course, uh, turned to a little bit of dismay. As, as the season went on, we found that it wasn't quite as easy as the start of the season was. We were starting to find out exactly why people spoke about, for years and years, just what a difficult competition the Sydney Premiership is to win. Because it's not one, two or five or ten weeks long it's an entire season, almost nine months' work that you've got to be available and at your best form. They laid the foundations of what will go down as an historic triumph with three tries in the first 23 minutes of the game. The back line showing the combination and skill that has taken Queensland and Broncos teams to so many memorable wins. And the forwards with back on Dowling inspirational were like steamrollers early. Tremendous performance by the Illawarra Steelers. It's been an absolutely magnificent cup final. 1989 Panasonic Cup champions, the Brisbane Broncos. A lot of people have suggested that uh, Wayne Bennett was a little bit worried because I was getting all the credit at the Broncos and that he wasn't. I don't really accept that. There was obviously a, a lot of uh, the credit going to, to me. It shouldn't have been. It should have been spread around the club and also the coach as well. I, I don't think that was a decision made uh, because of uh, uh, my, my common appearances in newspapers and, and television programs. It's something that I think um, has just followed the trend that's been going on for the past 12 years. It's something, it, it seems to, to follow each code. There's one player that uh, continually seems to get a few raps even when he doesn't deserve them, and that was me. I was summoned to a meeting with Wayne Bennett in late 1989. I went over to the Broncos clubhouse and I didn't think anything too much of it actually because it was quite a regular occurrence to, uh, to be called into Wayne's office to have a meeting. He used to tell you about what he thought about your form, uh, how you were training, all that sort of thing. I went in to see him and uh, he said, I want to talk about next year. And I said, fine. I thought he was going to tell me about the players we should approach or what was going to be happening. And he said, I'm taking the captaincy away from you. And anybody that knows Wayne Bennett would realise straight away that he doesn't joke. He's a fellow that uh, when he's talking common sense, he looks you directly in the eye, he doesn't muck about and just gets what he has to say off his chest. And I had that gut feeling that everyone gets in their life when they don't want to hear something. And I looked at him and I had a, a bit of an embarrassed smile, if anything, across my face. And I, I said, are you fair, Nick? And he said, yes, I am. I'm taking the captaincy away from you. And there was an eerie silence for 10 or 15 seconds and I just kept looking at him and trying to convince myself that maybe it was a dream or something. And then I looked at him and he said, do you want to know why? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, well, there's a couple of reasons. And he went on to explain how he needed all of his representative players 
to be available as often as possible, but realised that while the rep players were away, that someone else had to captain the side. Now, that was the, the start of a little bit of disappointment for me because uh, Gene Miles and myself had probably been the closest uh, two footballers at that stage. He was my best friend, had, had been for, for many, many years. Uh, and Gene was appointed eventually as, as the Broncos' captain. Now, Gene and I had, had spoken about our representative careers quite regularly. He came up to, uh, to see me about it and uh, he just said, what do you think about me and the Broncos' captaincy? And I, I looked at him and I was embarrassed and scratching myself and said, uh, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, would you be upset at all if I accepted the Broncos' captaincy? And I said, you can't. Wayne told me uh, in our meeting that uh, he wasn't going to consider any player that was a representative footballer for the Broncos' captaincy. He said it just wasn't in his plans at all. And Gene said, oh, look, I've been thinking about it and I've, I don't really want to play rep footy anymore. We both took a, a step in probably the wrong direction. I, I've got to admit it, I, uh, I, was, I was pretty angry at Gene to start with. I, I didn't think that he'd accept it. I put myself in the same position and uh, I thought, well, maybe if, if he was captain and that I was offered it, I'd sort of say, hey, no, look, you know, I think that the Gene should still be captain. Maybe I think you've made the wrong decision. I don't know whether I would have said that to Wayne if the roles had been reversed. It was a sad thing because we'd been very, very close friends for years and years. I'm pretty angry at myself uh, for the role I played in letting our friendship uh, separate uh, a little bit. Perhaps Gene played some small part in it. I'm not pointing the finger at him in, at all. Maybe it was... It should have been me that should have just uh, shut up and said, hey, yeah, OK. The only disappointing thing in the whole case was what the Broncos wanted me to do. They wanted me to say at that stage, I didn't want the captaincy. They wanted me to step away and say, look, I've decided that I don't want to captain the Broncos this year. I want to be away from... Uh, I'm going to be away from the club of Red football and I'd be pleased if someone else would take over that's going to be there full time. That would have been an easy way to step out of it, but for me, that, that's not what I'm about. I've, I've never tried to hide from, from anything. That, you know, it was explained to me that I wouldn't have to be embarrassed. I, I don't care if I'm embarrassed. I just want the truth told. He's the opportunity. He might go all the way. So what went wrong last Thursday at the place many thought would be Wally's retirement home, Broncos headquarters? Uh, we weren't in the position to make the uh, same offer that we made last year or else we wouldn't be able to keep some of our other players. So we've had to make a tough decision, and in this case, uh, unfortunately, uh, Wally won't be with us next year. It wasn't a great shock to many insiders that months of negotiations had finally broken down. Nevertheless, John Rebo was feeling the pressure as he dropped the axe. This has been a, easily the toughest decision I've had to make since I've been at the club. I, the, uh, you know, as far as Wally goes, he's... Uh, He's a legend and he's done a lot for rugby league for Queensland the last two, ten years and uh, unfortunately I'm the one that has to bear the bad news. That press conference started one of the most dramatic days in Queensland league history. By comparison politically, it was as stunning as Joe Bielke Peterson's resignation. There must have been 50 media personnel waiting for a red Mercedes Benz to arrive at Gilbert Park on Thursday afternoon. Lewis looked bemused. It's known he's bitter, he's resentful, but he handled the probing with aplomb. It's quite easily the most disappointing moment of my life. And I won't be saying any more than this, uh, any more than expressing my disappointment, uh, because the team have got a very important game. The news spread quickly. Dozens watched from the sidelines as Wayne Bennett tried to prepare his side for a preliminary final. But Bennett, too, was set upon. After all, he'd been the one who decided to sack Lewis as captain. You know, we've had our ups and downs. Uh, early in the season, I made my decision. There was nothing personal then. There's nothing personal now. I mean, if we can't afford to keep him here. That's the situation. We can't afford to stay at the price that was offered. Well, that's his decision. What I was disappointed in, in more than anything else, was that I wasn't sacked by Wayne. Because he'd said, and I think I can just about quote exactly his words, that he was responsible for all the hiring and firing of football talent in that club. He had the sole responsibility and had that given to him by all the directors of, of the club. Now, when I was given the axe, it was by John Rebo, and I probably would have preferred if Wayne had to come up to me and said, listen, I think uh, that your football days are finished or that you're a bad influence on the club or your playing days are over, you're a, you're a has-been, and we don't want you anymore. All I wanted was a straight-out answer, not 
some petty offer, the offer that was given to me, which John Rebo knew I was going to reject. Picked up by Stewart. They've got a fair few men to spare out there. Daly cutting back inside. Daly now gets it out to Belcher. Belcher decides to go himself. Bradley Clyde. Clyde on his way through now. Duffy slipped over. He's no chance of getting him. And here's another trade for the Canberra Raiders. And that makes... I often deliberated whether I was made a scapegoat. I'm not really sure. There's obviously a lot of pressure on Bennett. There was a lot of pressure on John Rebo as well. But I didn't think that the Broncos' failure in those two years was solely my fault. Now, I looked at it and there was only one change made in all that time, and that was my sacking. And I thought, surely it can't be one bloke's captaincy that's caused this club to fail so miserably. I think the biggest problem with myself and Wayne Bennett was that we just couldn't agree on a nice middleman area. By that I mean he had his ideals, what he wanted me to achieve, and I've always been a player that's, that's really done what he wanted on a football field, and I, I believe that's what's made me uh, so successful. I believe that by playing my own roles at any stage during a game and trying things that I think will be successful, you really can't plan a defensive method against that. Now, plenty of people have been successful in defence against me, but you, you can't plan it. It's just spur-of-the-moment stuff that you've got to react to. I prefer to stick uh, to my own methods that uh, have worked for me in the past. And players like Dale Shearer, Peter Jackson have been the same. They're guys that really have been able to do anything at any stage during a game and more times than not been very successful. I think that the three of us um, would probably be uh, more successful in teams not coached by Wayne. And in, in saying that, I'm not for one moment trying to indicate that he's not a good coach because he has proved in the past that he is a very good coach. But it's quite obvious that I'm best suited to a team uh, where Wayne Bennett's not involved. There's the break. Boyd, five by Wally Lewis. He needs a queen play the ball here. Sterling pumps the pass to Lewis and Lewis is in for the try. And Murray tacking nicely, rucking the ball up. This is Lewis. Lewis on the bustle now. Gets it away to Pierce. Spears gets it back to Lewis. Lewis over underneath the post. Punches are started. It's all on here now. Late part. Both sides are coming in. Lewis. A little chip. Lewis gets it back. Chance. Chance. Oh, yes. Jackson. Beautiful play for Lewis. 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 The crowd have gone up here in Australia right away again. Gary Jack gets it on to Eddie Housen. How he'll score. To Bobby Linder, Linder, Linder gets it to Lewis. Lewis will score. Australia again. Lewis under the post. The ball has gone out to Curry. Curry comes back in field. Over the 22. Try time. Try time for Lewis. Lewis scores. Now let's see what the Aussies can do now. It goes to Lewis. Lewis throws a little dummy. Then a high pass over for Sheridan. Sheridan makes the pass. Oh, look at this. I talked about a try. This is Lewis now. And Lewis is only about... Oh, they're throwing punches in there on that tackle on Lewis. It comes to Shearer. Oh, and there's another high shot. Oh, and what about that big hit from Lewis? There's always a lot of natural jealousy between Australia and New Zealand. And that's certainly on the rugby league field as well. One player in particular in the last test series made it just about his goal every game to be warned by the referee five or six times. Now, he got away with it. Perhaps that's the right thing to do. Maybe it's the wrong thing to do. Graham Lowe said that it was the wrong thing to do and he was embarrassed to be a Kiwi by some of, the, of their players' behaviour. Now, I'm not saying that the players themselves are doing the wrong, th wrong thing. Perhaps they're being instructed to play that way. Both captains are out. Huey McGahn for the Kiwis, Lewis for Australia, and Tennant laying down the law. Oh, and Lewis not happy. One of the downfalls, without any doubt, of the New Zealand side were the idiotic tactics that were employed by some of the players, and especially towards Lewis. Um, you know, trying to single him out. I don't know what the I don't I don't know what the plan was. I don't know. I couldn't really care. All I know, it was bloody ridiculous, and it didn't work. And it played right into Australia's hands. Like, uh, the game is the game is a hard, tough game. It's to me, it's the most 
well, to me, it's a it's a high speed collision sport. You know, to a certain extent, it's it's very very tough, and it's played by by uh, by guys that are, that are plenty tough as well. But the treatment that was dish, dished out by some of my own countrymen in that particular game, especially towards Wally, was idiotic. Like there's no part, and that that to me, like that. Wally probably got battered and bruised, and I actually think he broke his arm in that particular game, and he, and he certainly probably had some uncomfortable. Uh, moments throughout the game but he thrives on that he thrives on it. he just laughed at them lewis refuses to risk an early comeback against medical advice if i do come back too early i'm only going to break it again and uh, have to sit at home for a couple of months and go through more operations so uh, I, I think I'd be wiser to uh, to let the tour go and uh, and really make sure that the arm's 100% for next year. Lewis has a new fibreglass cast on the arm after the broken bone shifted slightly. He admits it's now a race against time to make the tour, the tour which has basically driven him to continue his playing career. Wally was ruled out of the team by the Australian medical officer, Dr Gibbs, Nathan Gibbs. And prior to the uh, prior to the medical examination, I rang Nathan Gibbs, and I said to him, Nathan, if uh, if you have any reservations about Wally's fitness, I would appreciate it if you give him the benefit of the doubt, because I think we owe him that. Nathan Gibbs said, Yes, I'll do that. He rang me before he announced to the press, uh, and said, Look, there's no way I could pass him as fit because his arm is broken. And uh, he's not, uh, and as a matter of fact, there should be a reassessment in probably anything from two to four weeks. He said, on your say so, if he'd have been 90% fit, I would have passed him. Now, if anything, Wally was given a little bit of an edge. I'd heard persistent rumours that my arm injury wasn't going to be passed fit. Now, there's been heated debate since that day of who was right and who was wrong. I eventually had to front the Australian Rugby League boss, Ken Arthurson, um, with my claims. I told them of my claims and that I had the proof there were a couple of journalists that were with me that day when a rugby league official said to them that I wasn't going to go on the tour. This official told the two journalists who come and passed the information to me. They uh, were both prepared to sign statutory declarations uh, to prove that. I fronted uh, Ken Arthurson about it and I, I didn't at all want to embarrass anyone in particular. All I wanted was a fair go and I didn't think that I was getting one in this stage. The fact of the matter is that I, I really think that Wally was incorrect there in saying the things he did because I've got the highest possible regard for Dr Gibbs, not only as a medical officer but as a person and uh, I, I thought that it was an unnecessary slur on um, on Dr Gibbs and um, Wally and I really did um, uh, fall out on that particular issue but you know I can understand in saying all of that you've got to understand how disappointed the guy must have been he was all set to establish a record which there's no doubt in the world he would have done he'd have been selected had he been fit he said that uh, he had spoken to somebody who uh, as a rugby league official passed uh, what was said more as a personal view than as a rugby league official's claims. Um, I had to accept those. I'd given Ken uh, my uh, uh, my beliefs on the on the incident, and he'd returned them. Missing out on the tour was was an extreme disappointment. The thing that was hardest to swallow out of everything that happened and all the disappointment, I couldn't understand why I was forced to face a medical test at a completely different time than any, any other player in the team. Wally has always had that um, remarkable propensity to, uh, to get people's back up, and, uh, and he certainly did get people offside. For anybody to say differently, they'd be having themselves on. But, you know, over the years, I've been under enormous criticism to relieve Wally Lewis of the captaincy of Australia, but uh, I've, uh, I've never succumbed to, uh, to that sort of um, temptation to do it because I honestly believe that he was the best man for the job, and I think he proved it. And, uh, and the biggest thing that I can always say in favour of Wally Lewis, he, uh, he was always proud to pull on the jumper, 
the green and gold jump of Australia, and he never ever let us down. South Wales and Queensland in the state of origin. He was a thinking man's footballer, the ultimate thinking man's footballer. One thing about Wally, um, he wouldn't ask anyone to do anything he wouldn't do. And uh, one thing you can be guaranteed with while he's on the field, you know that here's one guy, if you get stuck, he will look after you. Well, not look after you, but back you up. People in New South Wales hated Wally Lewis. And the more they hated him, the better he played. And he just had that tremendous knack just to... So when the chips were down, it was Wally Lewis for the Queenslanders to, to come to come of age. And he just did that week, uh, series in, series out. Wally was their leader, not just in the dressing room, not just in the game, but also in the uh, team camp, the hotel, also off the, pa- off the field, also away uh, from, the, uh, from the state of origin uh, arena. There are times in the game when, when a guy will come along and everybody says, oh, you can't let him get bigger than the game or you can't get him, let, let him get bigger than the club. He was. He was bigger than the club. He, he was bigger than the game up there. And he is bigger than the game. you just got to accept it. That's just, you know, you, you don't want too many of them coming along. But Wally, you know, as far as I'm concerned, anyway, any rate, Wally, like, there's Wally Lewis and then sort of coming along after them is Queensland, the Broncos, all the other, everyone else. Wally was able to get himself into a position and, it's, and he's been able to do it during his playing career where he has actually been bigger than the game. Series. 
Wayne Park, a football ground he's owned and dominated for more than a decade, and leaves the winner, the champion on this ground that he's always been. I really had to wrestle with my own thoughts and wonder whether we were going to be champions in 1991. Thankfully, that did happen, and I got the opportunity to retire from State of Origin football where I wanted to, and that was at Lang Park in front of a crowd that appreciated Queensland's success in that game. And for me, if I could write a storybook and title it any way that I wanted and write that last chapter, it couldn't have been any more perfect than that final night when we managed to wrap up the series. I think Australians ought to sort of put away the hatchets and um, the criticism and the pettiness and just acknowledge that we were privileged to be part of an era of sport where Wally Lewis was part of our lives and he's given us fantastic memories and you're lucky if you've got that.